Hello. Welcome to Mass Future Open Online Event. Today we have Ihor Cherischak with Want to Do Curriculum, and it's a new book. And the book is interesting in ways that are traditional and also innovative. It's about personal, a personal journey and also about communities online and uh, communities in physical space. So um, Mass Future is a series of meetings and a community in its own right. We get together with people who make mathematics their own and make something different with mathematics education, usually online. So uh, we invited Ihor because uh, he's been uh, working on communities and inviting children, teachers, uh, everybody really, to uh, change ways they are doing mathematics. So um, I would like Ihor to welcome you today and to invite you to talk about your work. And then we'll do questions. So uh, we can really write questions down and chat any time. And Diana, where are you from and what's your connection with this topic? Uh, so just so we all get introduced. I'm Maria Drushkova. I am in North Carolina, and I'm a mathematics education consultant. OK, so I guess I'm ready to go. So thank you, Maria, for the nice introduction. And uh, I'm going to begin by uh, sharing the quote that I opened my book with. And uh, when, when, when I imagine young children engaged in learning, the scene is dynamic. The faces of those children are alight with wonder, with puzzlement, with interest, and yes, with joy. When I picture students in many of today's classrooms, the image is often static, locked in a prescribed system of learning. The faces of many young people register boredom, disinterest, or resignation. Unfortunately, that is such a reality in many, many schools that kids are bored. And uh, we don't understand necessarily why that happens. Uh, we do, as teachers, we've tried our best. And yet still, the kids find it boring. So one of the things that to uh, share with you is that uh, uh, what can make a difference. And I'm here to, my book is an attempt to uh, explain that. Uh, the other thing, now let me get my buttons straight here. Okay. So first thing I want to do is define want to do, because that's kind of, uh, I know a couple of people were confused by that when I first announced it. And basically it's an excited form of I want to do. Like, for example, uh, I, you know, when I had math homework, I want to do it because I want to get good grades, but it's not because I'm so excited about doing homework. And that's kind of the distinction I make between wanting to do and want to do. And for me, playing baseball was a want to do thing. I could play it day and night, 24 hours a day. So, and it's the, uh, the opposite of a have to do curriculum, which uh, uh, it can be extreme or distasteful form of have to have to do. Um, for me, my first dynamic experience was swimming in Lake Erie with uh, with my father. Uh, that was a want to do activity that I was very excited about. And uh, again, uh, in fact, I had trouble sleeping the night before we drove up to Lake Erie. Uh, because uh, I was so excited. So that's sort of my first experience with that. Now, I grew up, uh, I'm, an, I'm an immigrant. I was born in Vienna, Austria. But we came to this country in 1950. And, uh, and we eventually moved to Pittsburgh in 1952. And it wasn't a very exciting place to be. Uh, and one of the things that kept me interested in things was was baseball. And uh, my favorite player, given that I was, grew up in Pittsburgh, was Stan Musial. Surprisingly, he played for the St. Louis Cardinals, but Stan actually was born in Denora, Pennsylvania, so he was a big hero in the Pittsburgh area. Now, 
I absolutely love baseball and baseball cards. I had all of them, and I read them conscientiously. And you see the backside of Stan Musial's card is all his uh, data about his experiences for 22 years in the major leagues. Uh, and I knew all that data for all hundreds of players that went on. So baseball for me was something that was very much uh, something that I enjoyed doing. Now, <clears throat> one of the kinds of games that I played was this all-star baseball game. This is one version of it. Uh, and I guess I was then 13 years old when I discovered it. And what was interesting about it was the way you had to play it. And you came up with, uh, they gave you discs for players. And in the version that I had, it was all players from many years uh, ago. For example, obviously, Dave Burns was a classic player from uh, the 40s, 30s, and 40s. But notice that his home run it was one on the, on the disc was a home run. So if you spun your spinner, if it landed on one, it was a home run. If it landed on a nine, that was a strikeout. So you can see that his number nine was bigger than his home run. <clears throat> and uh, so he would strike out much more often than he would hit a home run. However, Babe Ruth was probably one of the premier home run hitters. He had 714 home runs in 18 years of baseball. And notice that the angle it forms um, was 28 degrees on the disc and 30 degrees there. Now, what I wanted to do was to put some modern baseball players in here. So I had to make a disc for Stan Musial. And this is something I had to learn how to do. How do you decide how big the home run should be? So it turns out that I had to take ratios and start to learn proportional reasoning. And this was the first time I ever did anything on my own that was highly mathematical. Um, so for me, that experience sort of got me into the classroom and uh, learned more about, uh, as, I, as my math skills improved but through baseball, I became a better student in my class. So then that, that lasted until I was about 13 years, uh, I'm sorry, until 10th grade. And in 10th grade, I met somebody named Joey Bargan, who happened to be an assistant professor at Allegheny Community College. And, and Joey Buggan, uh one day showed me some of the things that he did in his classroom. And he was one of these charismatic kinds of teachers uh, that loved to bring in data from the outside. He did puzzles. He did games. And I got very, very excited about the possibility of being a math teacher. And sure enough, that's what I became. Uh, eventually. But I had to go through college first. You know, I couldn't just walk into a classroom and start teaching. This is my college. You know, Brooklyn Paramount Theater, of course, this is in 1930, uh, was the facade of a wonderful place that uh, housed a lot of great uh, performers over the years. And But this is what it looks like today. Royal University, that's the old Paramount uh, movie theater, and uh, theater. And uh, this is where I start, started studying mathematics in a more serious way. In fact, I was so serious that I almost dropped out of math because it, I discovered that what I was doing in high school was nothing compared to what college mathematics was like. You had to be, I was with a bunch of kids who were, wanted to be mathematicians. And I didn't know what that was. And it wasn't until I discovered the 500 section of the library because, you know, reading textbooks took me a to do one page took me, you know, could take me all day. Uh, but when I discovered the 500 section, I, I found books written about mathematics that were interesting. I was turning pages and I was very excited about what I was learning. So all of a sudden, mathematics became something of interest and, I, and my, my grades improved in college and I was doing much, much better. So uh, that led me on. Uh, I had a good uh, professional um, uh, moderator who was my mentor uh, who helped me with uh, learning and I, I student taught at uh, George Westinghouse School in Brooklyn, New York. My first teaching job was in Carteret High School. And in Carteret High School, uh, I had two courses that I was teaching, uh, three sections of Algebra one and two sections of General Math. 
And this is me teaching Algebra 1, uh, which I love. And three sections of really teaching bright, bushy-tailed kids who really enjoyed uh, uh, doing the, the work. They, again, they didn't really want to do it. They, they, they were doing it because they wanted to get good grades, but they were really fun kids to, to work with. So uh, with the general math, it was a whole other story. I don't know if you remember the TV show Welcome Back, Cotter, uh, where there was, the students were, were uh, called, referred to as sled hogs. I had a few kids that reminded me of those students. And uh, uh, I was really, I hated it. You know, I hated the process of having to teach them and uh, made me want to think that maybe teaching wasn't for me. Until one day I discovered the stocks and bonds game. And uh, this is a, a, a game that you play with cards and the board and, you know, the traditional kind of game that uh, Milton Bradley put out. And I tried it with my students, my sled hogs, and all of a sudden I had engagement. I had kids who were interested and we were doing uh, buying and selling stocks and and stuff like that, and I was, I was thrilled by what was going on. And fast forward 35 years, I did the stock market game with a group of sixth graders, and we built the whole game from scratch uh, using uh, companies that the kids were familiar with, and we had a competition. And so that stocks and market game got me to do a stock market game with a group of uh, uh, sixth graders in an urban school in uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey. So back to my career, uh, college uh, was difficult, but I got through it and I did decently. But again, my passion for mathematics wasn't there. And I got to Columbia Prep, uh, where I taught uh, for five years. And one of the things that I did, because I, I discovered that they had a textbook by Dulciani, Mary Dulciani, and I found it terribly boring and I hated teaching boring stuff to kids, even though these were kids that were uh, very interested, and most of the kids were interested in learning, but they were bored with the materials as well. So I had to shift gears, and what I did is I wrote a whole program, an independent program of 24 units. Uh, it's amazing what they allowed you to do in the 70s, and uh, uh, so I was very, uh, got involved and did a lot of writing. I never published the work that I did. But I still use the ideas for the rest of the career. And I noticed that Don Cohen just arrived. And one of the things that I attended was Don Cohen's workshop in the, in the 70s. It was around 1972. And uh, one of the things that Don told me about is he wanted to have kids not only learn the math that the teachers were sharing with them, but also to invent mathematics, make it their own. And that's a lesson that I learned from Don Cohen. And I thank you for being here. So uh, the independent program, I allowed the kids to go at their own rate. And what happened is I wasn't teaching regular classrooms anymore. I was just around, going around counseling kids in groups and small groups. And I found myself not enjoying it as much. And one student pointed out to me that, Ehor, you're not smiling much anymore. So uh, I kind of uh, was uh, uh, disappointed. And I know I had to regroup. And I know I had to learn more. Uh, of what was going on. So I moved from Columbia Prep, which was a fairly traditional school, even though they allowed me to, to really experiment with my teaching. Uh, when I got to Brooklyn Friends, that was an open classroom kind of uh, deal where kids were really independent and they selected their own courses and we had interesting meetings that went on, uh, uh, morning meetings and uh, the kids it was diff differently organized. And while I was there, uh, I discovered computers. And this was the computer that changed my life. Uh, I went from working with kids to working with the computers and adults because I was started working with a company called Plain to Win, which hired me as a programmer to develop programs for the Commodore Pet. And notice there's a calculator keyboard, not very easy to do any real typing. And I was making $10 an hour in 1981, and it was thrilling to make $20,000 a year. I was very excited. Uh, notice here's a lab of pet computers. Now, this isn't my lab. 
I, uh, um, but I had maybe six or seven of them and, and did pretty much what was going on in this classroom here. Uh, this is the Microcomputer College Teacher Center. Uh, actually, that's the wrong slide. That's not the, we, we, we didn't go that far back. Uh, this is more like what it was. Uh, there were, we had the Commodore Pets, and uh, we had TRS-80s uh, around, and the software came on cassette recorders, and there was a lot of interest. This is in 1981, and notice there's a lot of students there, but actually a lot of teachers, and we got crowded a lot of the time. So we were helping teachers in the beginning stages. Now, eventually, of course, that all became the Communication Media and Learning Technology Center of, of Teachers College, which is on involved. But we were the pioneers. Karen Billings was the director of the Microcomputer Resource Center in 1981. Uh, and those were very heady times and very exciting for me. That, in fact, I got my master's degree in, in, in computers and technology uh, rather than doing the math part. Um, I had jobs, and that led me to jobs with where I did training and, and uh, staff development with first with BOCES, uh, where I set up a similar lab to the Microcomputer Resource Center at Teachers College, and then got a job with Logo Computer Systems and a top logo writer, uh, which was a version of Logo at the time. And of course, Seymour Packard was the main guy uh, for, for Logo, and he was a very charismatic and eloquent speaker who never, never got invited to speak to an NCT meeting. Logo was a disruptive activity. What I mean by that is that it was an activity that wasn't accepted ordinarily into schools uh, as a main part of the, uh, the menu for, for students, uh, but it was something that could potentially become uh, uh, something that everyone used if it, if it finally uh, was established. But Logo, for some reason, just never made it, mostly because it required programming, which was really difficult. This is a little hard to see. One of the things that we did with Logo uh, at the end of a, t of a meeting in, 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 uh, at an NCTM annual meeting uh, was to organize and have a group of people that wanted to do Logo because NCTM really didn't support it and we started an organization called the Council for Logo and Math Education. That's where the twine comes from. Um, and uh, so we moved on and if you notice uh, Annie Fetter, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, uh, the math forum, she was on there and that was in 1996. So in a way we did uh, presentations. Klein was invited every year to speak at the annual meetings and I always had a, a bunch of people that would speak uh, to the themes that I wanted and Klein wanted uh, folks to do. So that was, again, very exciting times uh, back are, in the early 90s. Yes? I'd like to pause here because it's, uh -huh. it's been quite a trip already, <laughs> journey. Uh, so I'd like to pause uh, for a bit and to do some questions. Just sure. so we can um, uh, we can um, address some of the things. And so, um, uh, so uh, do any of the of our guests have questions? And if so, you can do the microphone. It's open microphone. You just press the talk button and you talk, or you can type your question in the chat. And um, I would like to start while people may be formulating questions or thinking about it. So when you had an, um, I'll, I'll bring you back to this slide, um, but when you had slides with computers, everybody seemed so engaged at all times. Yeah. So you can see this very simple machines really, and then you can see children really engaged in them. And yeah, some <laughs> professional ones, but <laughs> right. That was but, the from 1948. <laughs> so, but if we go back to this, you see this incredible just eyeball glued to screens, and we see it to this day, even though computers are very ubiquitous now. 
So, what is it about technology that does that? What What's happening here? Welcome, Michael. So, um, we we are talking about computers. What do you think, Ihor? Well, what it was for me was was a, it absolutely changed my life because I, I borrowed Karen Billings' Commodore Pet and I took it up to my room on a middle of a summer vacation, and I turned the thing on, and then all it was doing was blinking at me, and then I had to learn the language uh, to be able to make it do something, and, uh, and there were there were already some basic games written basic that that uh, uh, I was playing and I wanted to turn them into math games. And so I, had, I learned basic that way. Uh, and it was just such an uh, incredibly empowering experience for me that I spent, uh, uh, you know, time would just fly. I mean, I wouldn't sleep, I wouldn't eat, I would just keep programming and, and learning. And then when I brought them into the classroom with the kids, the kids were so engaged and they wanted to play with them. And I knew there was something fundamentally different about this technology that I couldn't capture in textbooks or manipulatives or other kinds of things uh, that I wanted to use this, the power of it uh, with, with children uh, to, uh, to, uh, to teach math. What is web something? So what is what? you say uh, there is something fundamentally different about it. Yes. What, yes. What it, is it? it well, it, it, it's, it's something that's just the engagement. I think students are always attracted to them. I guess today it's it's your handhelds, it's your it's your um, uh, smartphones. Uh, it's engaging because they want to communicate with their their friends and their co and, and, and via these these smartphones and uh, they, they can't put them down and I think that same engagement uh, when computers were non-existent and all of a sudden you found them in classrooms you know I, I think nothing has really changed the engagement is still there it's just that we need to learn ways how to to incorporate it for effective learning, and I think we're doing that. I think you're doing it, Maria, and I think a lot of people are doing it. It's just not mainstream yet, and uh, we have to break the, the problems of testing and, and uh, uh, the common core, which, which makes people, teachers, nervous, whether they're doing it right, and uh, not enough for exploration. I mean, in, in, at Columbia Prep, I was able to write my own curriculum for 7th and 8th grade. And I don't expect teachers to write curriculum, but it, it, was, it was a time where, where teachers were empowered to do things like that. And uh, it doesn't always happen uh, today. So I guess that's my way of answering that question. So there is a... Um uh, there is a question in chat. Um, so many teachers tell me students can't learn math without a pencil and paper. What would you say to mm -hmm. them? What would I say to them? <laughs> well, you, to, to, be, to be honest, I think I, I, uh, I recently read somewhere where uh, they were asking how many still use today. Kids have smartphones and so on. Uh, Still prefer to read off the screen. Do they prefer to read off the screen or, or read off paper? And 60% of them said they prefer to read off paper. And I think the same thing with paper and pencil. They're 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 used when appropriate for the kids. And uh, uh, you know, and you do with the computer. It's appropriate to do with the computer or a calculator or or any kind of mechanical device. You know, uh, making phone calls now is a lot easier with a cell phone than a landline. Uh, even though I have a landline and a cell phone, uh, uh, you know, we use both. But uh, I know somebody in my family and friends uh, have switched and do totally a smartphone. Now, this is an example of technology being used in an appropriate way to, to do the kinds of things. And I'm starting to talk about the second half of or the, actually the last 10 minutes of my talk, which is to have people do what they want to do. In, in other words, what's important to them, uh, uh, and that's uh, what I think how people use smartphones right now.
and paper and pencil is still around. You know, I mean, I got my pen right here, and I'm taking notes on three by five cards, so <laughs> it doesn't go away. But what has changed? It's so interesting to see. So you've been using computers for so long. Right. What, what do you think changed in how, um, well, we still love our machines. You know, we, we still see this engagement. So this has not changed. Yes. Um, but there are some generational things. So yes. what would you say ha have what what things you you would say have changed, you know, since the 80s or the 90s, early 2000s? Well, I, I think more so than the kids. I think I think the technology has changed, and and because of that, it's 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 more adaptable to kids to use. I mean, when I when I think of the 80s, here's an example: at Brooklyn Friends School. Uh, I, I introduced the, the pet computer to, to the classrooms. There was a candy store around the corner where I watched kids play video games, and they're pu putting in quarters and playing video games. All boys, okay, absolutely all boys. At the end of the year, by spring, there were just as many girls in there as boys, and that's because I introduced them to something, a new technology, and all of a sudden they found the engagement. The technology itself doesn't engage. But what the technology does, in other words, what service it provides for the students, and they buy into that service, and they want to use that service. Uh, uh, so, so for video games, are very compelling to kids. And, but in, in 1980, they had to go out of their way to a candy store or wherever they were around. I mean, we, we you know, the young folks don't, don't know it or don't remember it, or us older folks don't remember that you had to go somewhere. You know, there wasn't any internet cafe. It was, it was uh, candy stores that had video games. Uh, nobody had one at home. So I, I think the, the, the fact that the, the, um, uh, the computers, the technology, not computers the way I viewed them, but the technology is multi uh, uh, What's the, what's the word I'm, I'm thinking of? It's multi-purposeful. It, it can do many things. It always could do many things, but it wasn't obvious in the early days. So Papper talked about Mo, uh, Logo and how uh, the, the uh, computer was an object to think with. He was thinking about uh, uh, all sorts of things because the metaphor used for a computer was a pencil. Interesting. You asked me about pencils and computers and pencil that can do various things. It's just a tool. But what it, the tool now is able to do that was, was very different what, uh, what was in the 80s. But the impact on the children is the same, okay? Uh, it's just now that they, they have it right in their, you know, their bedrooms, their, their pockets when they walk, in schools, there's more bring your own device uh, available. So there's a lot of things now that are going on that just weren't available in the 80s. So can I just move on and, and just go to the last couple of slides? Because I only have sure. five more to go. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, my final job before I retired was at the Center for Improved Engineering and Science Education, better known as SEAS, and uh, affiliated with the Stevens Institute of Technology. This is the current website. And what SEAS did was develop and support effective, innovative curricula and professional develops and so on, and they continue to do that. When I was do, working on it, uh, it was really the same thing. Basically, uh, I, I infused technology in the math instruction. What I wanted to do was to integrate technology into the curriculum uh, and have the t teachers develop uh, a set of resources that can help them teach. Uh, and I work mostly in urban school districts. Seas uh, um, would uh, yeah, have contracts with school districts, and I would go in and work with the teachers, uh, with high school initially, and then mostly with middle school teachers. And uh, so we developed learning environments for, for the technology. Mostly it was a, uh, a teacher at the front of the room with an overhead projector presenting lessons, and then, and then the lesson was fairly conventional. So the teaching was fairly conventional, uh, one computer 
kind of classroom learning. And then if we wanted to have a lab situation, you had to go down the hall and get the lab. Uh, that was still pretty prevalent in the 17 years that I was at Stevens in the 90s. That was how it was. And learning uh, it was still pretty much students learn and teachers talk. And what, what we were noticing today is that there, those two things are blending together. Teaching and learning are blending together. And I'm going to talk about that a little later. And of course, trying to develop some alternate assessments. Uh, so the three-part lesson, the thing that it turned out, less is more. I, I tried to do too much in my early years with the teachers. I tried to do all six of those objectives. Uh, to try to get them to do that. And, and then I just got down to, I just wanted to do a lesson that I think would be effective. And the first step of my three-part lesson was to set the stage. I, I used to put the objectives down. You know, I'd say, uh, uh, here's, uh, here, our objective today is uh, to learn the associative law. Uh, I stopped doing that. I did something interesting first and engaged the kids, and then we did an activity, and then the briefing was really about, well, what did we learn today? And the kids would say, well, we learned that uh, the association kind of works with numbers, including something called the associative law. In other words, the activity brought out the idea, and I had my core objective met. And that was something that I repeated, and I would do, I would model it with the teachers first, then I would uh, have uh, we'll, we we work together. I worked with the teacher to do the activity, and then I asked them to do it on their own. And because urban schools have a multitude of issues and problems, it was very difficult to kind of incorporate this. And I, I was disappointed a lot. Uh, but there were also some teachers that really blossomed in this arena, and to this day, some of them even became speakers and leaders in the in the field of the technology and math. So so 17 years were really, uh, uh, you know, a godsend. I, I, what I wanted to do was teach at university get my doctorate and I never got out of the seas mode because I was doing what the doctor would have gotten to me. So I was very pleased with, uh, with uh, my career there. Now, <clears throat> I retired in 2007 and one of the things that I wanted to do after I retired was to learn about Web 2.0 and social media. I used to get talks at NC Tem meetings and ask, well, what's Web 2.0? How many of you know what Web 2.0 is? And I had two hands out of 30 that would be raised. Nobody was aware of it. And we wanted to, it was obvious that math was, was moving in that direction, uh, and we needed to work with teachers to make that happen. So uh, I know Maria and I did a session called In Search of Math 2.0, and I kind of found it, I think. Math 2.0 for me is the continuing emergence of dynamic math software. Uh, for algebra, it's, it's spreadsheets. For geometry, it's a sketch pad or GeoGebra. For, for all other topics, it's, it's what Patrick called micro-worlds. It's learning of environments that involve uh, some form of technology uh, that engage kids and want to make them want to make them learn stuff that, that's, that's very critical to understanding math. And certainly uh, uh, appeal to the stakeholders, uh, the ones that want the core curriculum standard and the assessments to work out. And that we felt micro worlds would, would do this, which are the series of activities that kids do. Now we're moving to micro worlds and beyond. Uh, and I refer to math textbooks, which I go back to the original uh, Thing that I presented, which was the boredom problem, uh, where uh, as Kareem Ani of Math Alicia said that uh, uh, you know I, I'd rather take out the garbage than do my math homework, and uh, the, that is prevalent. And I wanted an anecdote of that. What what could be the thing that solved that particular problem? And um, and I came up with this, and with the help of Gary Steger and others of adventures that kids actually want to do. Textbooks can evolve into something that kids want to read. When I was in college, I discovered W.W. W. Sawyer, uh, when I had a linear algebra course that I didn't understand, and I couldn't get past the page in the textbook. I found W.W. W. Sawyer, I read his linear algebra book, and I couldn't believe how I was reading it like a real book. And it was interesting, and there was anecdotes, and it was written. Uh, and I think math textbooks need to evolve into this kind of world 
where the kids actually want to read these things. They actually want to do them. And it's, we know it's possible uh, uh, with work. So I share examples uh, in my book of the uh, various kinds of ways to do it. And I mentioned four of them there. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, move on to the next slide. Here's, I talked about logo being a disruptive activity. And logo failed because the learning curve was way too hard for most teachers. You had to learn how to uh, uh, program. And a lot of math teachers were leaving to become computer teachers, and NCTN hated that, and so they kind of boycotted. Seymour Patrick uh, never got to speak at, uh, at math conferences. But Dan Meyer, on the other hand, has broken through. NCTM now has embraced it. And he also uh, posed the same question that I pose. I'm not sure because I, was, I did this in keynote. Let's see what happens next. OK. Uh, and, and I, was, I wanted to show you a video clip, but basically he asks uh, this. He says this in, in his TED talk. Can I ask you to please recall a time when you really loved something? a movie, an album, a song, or a book, and you recommended it wholeheartedly to some of you really liked. You anticipated that reaction, and you waited for it, and came back, and the person really hated it. By way of introduction, that is exactly the same state I spent every working day for the last six years. Again, this was in 2010, well before uh, uh, Dan was already a star, a kind of almost a rock star here in the math community. I teach high school math. I sell a product to a market that doesn't want to buy it, but is forced by law to buy it. Uh, it's just a losing proposition. And, and my question is, how can we turn the situation into a winning one? And I, I really address that issue in the book, and I talk about it. It's the one do ventures that by changing textbooks, we, we can make a significant difference. And I think we need to start to talk about uh, uh, curriculums that are meaningful to kids, not just to the adults that dictate what's going on. So uh, uh, my book is a call to that. Uh, and I, wanted, I want the want to do curriculum to kind of become uh, a buzzword out there and, uh, because I think it's really important. So uh, I'm now open to questions <laughs> or comments for that matter. It's interesting about the love part and how how we can share what we love in well appropriate ways. And so uh, Dindarian comments are saying, uh, "I've been reading Life of Fred to my kids. They enjoy the story." Uh, yes. Okay. And what's a what's an example of somebody? sharing what they love uh, in, well, in a way that works. So computers seem to be a way to share what we love in ways the children also do. Yeah, Diana? We, we have. Go oh, ahead. No, no, no. Either Diana or Jeremy or Michael want have something to share about that. Diana has a question in chat you can see, uh, hopefully. What is I the best tech it. program? You don't see the chat? I have a chat, supervised chat, but I don't see Dan's question. Let me see if I, oh, maybe, ah, I'm not in the room. Oh, OK, now I see it. Uh, OK, so uh, I'm looking for Dan. What is the best tech program in your mind now for K2 students? Uh, wow, uh, good question. Uh, uh, there, there are a lot of programs, probably apps, uh, that you can find. I'm not, I'm not that knowledgeable about K to two, uh, um, but I know that there were programs available that uh, you could search, and uh, 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 maybe someone else has some suggestions for that level. Because my, my area is sort of middle school where, where spreadsheets and geometry sketch pad and, and uh, uh, logo-like uh, programs uh, that are still out there that are 
uh, requires some coding uh, uh, for kids. But uh, for, for second K to two, there, there are a lot of apps available. I know that. Um, yeah. It's interesting, uh, Diana, this question is, is it almost like a trick question, I want to say, because um, what is what works really well will, and uh, I'll, I'll just say something very um, uh, a banality here. I'll be the master of the, of the obvious and say it, it depends on how you use it and what the children like. Um, there are some uh, good uh, programs that fulfill particular needs. So, for example, um, so for example. Uh, if you want to work on uh, design, uh, on, on programming, on mathematics or coding, uh, so Scratch and Loga and um, maybe uh, even GeoGebra would work for young kids. But I would say Scratch is very good for that. Now, uh, if you want to work on something like early algebra, there are a couple of games on, uh, there are actually several good ones, uh, bigger ones on the math playground, uh, but uh, also apps like um, uh, Dragon Box that have algebra in them. And so uh, there are some young children really like the uh, back end of Khan Academy, not the videos, but uh, the interactive part of it. Some children don't. And uh, that depends largely if the child is okay with um, kind of a gamification there. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the goals uh, and on the child. Um, I wish there was a, ba a big, big, bad, well-designed, well-maintained uh, catalog of everything. And I think actually Mass Forum comes the closest to it. But um, it's, um, it's, it's not like Pandora's box for music where you say, OK, I love this song, and it finds you five more that you also like. So far, we don't have a thing like that for mathematics activities. Uh, but it's something people dream about, that you kind of go in, find something your child finds meaningful right now, and then find more activities that are as engaging. So um, it's an unsolved problem yet, actually, what are some good tech programs. I hope. It helps a little bit. I work with younger kids, so I wanted to jump in. Um, so I just use open tools like GeoGebra, Scratch, um, and um, even Wolfram Alpha, though it's for probably for older kids. But I use it um, or the graphers, um, basically maker tool here. Uh, so spreadsheet, for some strange reason, young children, yeah, Desmos, Young children really love spreadsheets if you help them to program them a little bit. And we are actually designing, we are going to be, uh, yeah, uh, it's called, uh, I'll type it. Uh, it's, an, it's a free online thing that's pretty powerful. Um, so uh, we are going to be designing some activities for young children and spreadsheets. Uh, like a mini course for parents to introduce them. But as as, uh, as Ihor said, it's not about the tech itself, it's what you do with it. So um, even games that are all kind of already designed for independent engagement, uh, they are still, um, I mean, they still require framework for, to work well. Okay. Right. right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There, there, there are a lot of uh, pieces of software that are in applets uh, available for a variety of exploration. One of the things I discovered uh, is that there are not that many that that are good because you if you go to the map and just sort of search 
for um, applets or apps. Uh, there's a ton of ton of them available, but some of them, uh, the, for example, one developed by uh, uh, Keith Devlin. Uh, the name escapes me right at the moment, but uh, he he came out with one that was really good and. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, I, I don't remember his name, but if you search Keith Devlin, uh, good guy his name. It's Was It pr tr Trouble. That's was it. it. <laughs> was It? Something like was that. It Trouble? There you go. There you go. You have to search for that. Uh, that's an interesting one. And uh, Keith is, uh, also writes uh, about various kinds of apps that. Uh, we were still in the beginning stages of developing good apps for 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 math. Uh, there you go. Uh, it was in trouble, and uh, uh, that developed the kind of uh, open-ended problem-solving uh, skills that we want kids to have. There's plenty of uh, drill and practice and Dragon Box app. That's great. Um, there are plenty of drill and practice types of things that are out there, and some are very clever and very creative. Uh, I've done some uh, evaluation of those programs, and uh, they're moving in the right direction, but they still have a long way to go. The kind, the kind of program, again, that uh, uh, that I think is is going to make a difference in, in, in the long run are the programs that allow the kids to to explore different topics that they're interested in, and uh, uh, in their applications. That's why I kind of say for algebra, uh, the spreadsheet will continue to be a powerful tool. And there's variations of that that you'll find. And, and, um, there's also uh, programs uh, that come that, uh, uh, for a geometry, of course, Sketchpad and then GeoGebra are, are the strong ones there. And there are plenty of other kinds of uh, programs out there that are that are useful, but uh, uh, like I said, there's still very few. And uh, Keith Devlin actually has been developing. Uh, he developed uh, the uh, Was It Trouble, and uh, he's uh, I look forward to more development that he does because uh, he's got something more in line where where the idea behind a video game. His idea was a video game could be used as a vehicle to teach math in very powerful ways. And uh, so he's a good man to follow and, and learn more from. Uh, so um, what, what are you hoping to will happen with this book now that it's out? So what do you, what do you hope people will want to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the, the whole idea behind the book was, uh, it was four years in the working, and it's 136 pages. Uh, I, it's it's you know it's nicely short and an easy read. You can read it in the afternoon. Uh, and I go into several examples that uh, I enjoy. One of the ones that uh, programs that is my favorite uh, is called uh, Green Blobs and Graphing Equations. Uh, uh, I'm just reading Michael's <laughs> post. <laughs> Skeptical about computer games teaching math in any conceptual way. I think he seems to see it. That's a clever way to get kids to practice basic computation. Um, computer games, yes, I think. But uh, uh, the kinds of games, kinds of programs that uh, he does recommend are, are more open-ended, and they're not games in the classic sense. But uh, but the idea of uh, of having uh, uh, well. The, his idea, uh, refresh my memory on what, what the name of his uh, latest book was. Maria, do you remember what it was? Um, I am hesitant to say because he publishes a couple of a year. So, a couple uh, of years. <laughs> uh, so when you say latest, but um, uh, Keith has a book about games. 
and um, about mathematical game design. And I think it talks about uh, more open projects. And then uh, he had an article that made uh, rounds. Um, Michael, and you probably saw this one where he mentions uh, world of Minecraft, like the world, the virtual world where well, people yeah. would go and um, and uh, basically explore. So. Um, uh, I um I I'll look up uh, the the math game book um and yeah. uh, give people the link to it but uh yeah so but Ihor that's a question to you I guess do you see computers and computer based mathematics as a conceptual tool or is it more like well See how people love computers? What gets the computer to do the boring part of work? Um, computers, uh, the, the actual computers are evolving, and, and they have evolved tremendously already into a handheld device, which everyone will have, and used for things that are important to them. Uh, in other words, it would be more natural. Uh, right now, when I showed you the slides of, of, of uh, the Commodore pets in the classroom, that was a very contrived way of using computers. But it was very exciting because it was brand new and anything exciting. Remember the first cell phone? It was the size of, a, uh, it was like a foot long and uh, weighed about eight, six pounds. Uh, but it was very exciting because it was the beginnings of what cell phones are today. And, and uh, the same thing with, with math apps and programs. They're, they're developing to be useful in a variety of ways. And I see a dramatic change in what's going on with, with people that are, are using these programs. Because now it's, it's, it's fairly commonplace, uh, uh, you know, in different models of teaching, like the flipped classroom, for example, is, a, is something that's e evolving. Uh, one of the, the things was, a, was nice to see, and I and gotten to the point where the, the uh, NCPN has finally caught up in a sense and is promoting things and I don't want to, I think Dan Meyer has a lot to do with it, is to get them to see the light that there, there are lots of different ways to use computer programs that are, that are very powerful and, but, in, but, in, but yet there, there are activities that kids actually want to do and that's really at the heart of it. Um, so I, I, I kind of am, 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 I believe things will get better, you know, uh, even though there's still a lot of skepticism, there's still a lot of confusion about what kind of games should be, or sorry, what kind of computer uses in the classroom uh, is still an open question. But I think it's, it's developing and the want to do curriculum is, is something that uh, I hope will evolve. And because I think cur curriculums need to be written in a way that kids will want to read. That's, that's the key uh, to my message and what I have to say. The, the specifics of the examples, uh, th they're all transitory. Things, things are evolving as we, as we speak. You know, people coming up with new ways of looking and thinking. And unfortunately, a lot of really good textbooks that actually adopted that thing didn't make it into the, just like Seymour Papert didn't make it into prime time, uh, Dan Meyer has. He's, he's made it into prime time. Somebody else will take his place that maybe will promote, because Dan is, is fairly traditional in his approach to math, even though the thing, the thing that's powerful about Dan Meyer is that, that he, he really has strong technology, uses technology in a very seamless kind of way. In other words, it's sort of in the background and he produces these uh, wonderful things. So he doesn't talk about, you know, writing code or, 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 you know, how to use this particular program or recommend this kind of program. He's talking about conceptual ideas about what makes uh, 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 technology be an integral part of the curriculum, not, not integrated into the curriculum, but an integral part of the curriculum. And that, that's kind of what's going on. So you said, um, so you said, um, Don, are you talking? 
Well, I'm listening mostly. Can you hear me? Yes. I was listening. <laughs> I okay. have a trying to figure I'm out what, what to say. <laughs> <laughs> Don, you've said a lot over the years. I'll tell you, you've said a tremendous amount over the years. I just want to thank you for being who you are and, and what you've been, and uh, I admire you very much. <laughs> thank you. I, 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 Thank you for coming. <laughs> I wanted to say something about what happened today. Uh, okay. I take a taxi from where I live to the nursing home where my wife is. And the taxi driver is a black man, about uh, 60, I would guess. And I gave him one of my little books to look at. A, a couple of weeks ago, and he hadn't done too much with it. So I decided to do a lesson with him, <laughs> with the taxi driver, right? Uh, I don't know what I'm doing most of the time. So I get him in a room in the in the nursing home there, and we do uh, infinite series. <laughs> and it was <laughs> funny because... <laughs> By the time he drove me back to my place, he had figured out that if you start with one, well, if you start with like a third plus a ninth plus a twenty-seven, it's going to go to a half, all right? It approaches a half as an infinite series. And I ended up, uh, I went into Walgreens, it came out, and I said, what if you have one over N and you start with that? And he was teaching, <laughs> so ended up, he figured out 1 over n minus 1. It goes to that, which, you know, floored me because I didn't know that he could do that. The, the, the thing I have is now is I'm only thinking working with individual kids, okay? I don't have my classes in my home anymore, where I used to have up to five kids. But I find <laughs> that experience today <laughs> with the ca taxi driver, um, I thought was very funny. I don't know what you would think of it, <laughs> but uh, I just have this thing about working with individual kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I've been doing since I retired. I've been working with individual. Well, I worked with individual kids when I was going at 57 students a week. But they would come in small groups. And I think that the, the small groups and individual work with kids is a key to a lot of stuff. Because you can look in their eyes. You can see what they're thinking about, you know. Yeah. Uh, do they have a question, you know, or, you know, I think it's, I don't know, there's something about working individually with a kid or anybody or a taxi driver. <laughs> uh, there's something about learning something from them and getting them to do things, which yeah. is the key thing, getting them to do things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're sort of a, uh, I have my gurus uh, uh, that, uh, you know, promote certain things, aspects of math education. And you're, you're the one that on a one-to-one -one basis or a one-to-five one basis is probably the champion uh, over the years about how you can accomplish because you're, I just made a, uh, put up a link of your book about calculus for and by young people, and I think uh, that's really a classic, and uh, it just shows that what's possible for young children, what they can learn if, if, if the right environment is there and they want to do it. Uh, they, they, they want to talk to somebody, and you can get them involved in talking. Right. Right. Uh, the other, another example I use is um, when I do logarithms. Now, 
when I do logarithms, I write down 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 10, 100, 1,000. And then I get them to guess what the log is. They don't know what a log is. They don't That's have right. to know what a log is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you introduce uh, words in context. They, 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 they go to the calculator and they do the log of zero. Right. And there's, there's no answer, right? Uh, and right. then the log of one. And I'm doing LOG at this point, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And I keep doing that until they begin to look at what's going on. Yeah. And they yeah. can yeah. see that the log of Four is uh, log of eight is three times the log of two or something like that. Right. You know, right. they see right. Right. The numbers, and then eventually you can show them the slide rule and see how that's based on logarithms, and that's uh, and something I, have, I do. I have circular slide rules. So circular. Wow. Yeah. 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 So and slide rules right. shouldn't be shouldn't be put in the closet because they can be used for various topics. And this is part of the, the, the want to do curriculum, you know, is doing things that engage kids, and you've been doing it all your life. So you did it for me back in 1972. <laughs> you changed my direction. You changed my direction. So, uh, what, year? what year? What year I got? 1972. Uh, uh, I remember walking with you outside of PS, uh, what was it, 2, 21, uh, in New York yes, City, and uh, you, you told me about uh, kids ought to invent their own mathematics. So I went home and said, well, if kids can invent their mathematics, I should be able to invent my mathematics. But then I discovered how hard it was to invent mathematics. So all I wanted to do was to invent something that was already invented, but do it, you know, with the attitude, well, I'm not going to look at it, what's been done, see what I can develop with it. And, and for me, it was the... Uh, um, uh, which which problem was it? Uh, Pick's theorem was the one that I I Pick spent theorem, I, yeah yeah I, I spent hours on that. I mean it's a simple uh, conclusion, but uh, uh, but a very powerful uh, thing because you count the number of um, you put a piece of rubber band around a bunch of uh, nails, and then you count the number of nails inside, and you count the no number of nails on the, the touch the rubber band, and there's a relationship between the area, you know, which, is, which to me was absolutely marvelous. You know. <laughs> Ihor. Do you graph? Ihor. Ihor. Brown Ihor. Yeah. Yeah. Do you graph in three dimensions? That's, 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 that's right. In three dimensions, graphing. Yeah, I, I haven't tried that. Maybe now you you just inspired me to do that. <laughs> oh, have to grab it. Thank you, Don, for who you've been and who you are. I appreciate you coming on. Well, I'll tell you, I'm I'm in the process of writing some stuff. I think I might have sent it to you, Maria. Please do. Oh, uh, Maria. Uh -huh. What? A lady in England asked me, she wanted to know about can my I, can material. Can I interrupt for a second? I think, Maria, maybe we ought to put closure on the session, and uh, then we can continue talking. Oh, we got to stop? Um, yeah, we're already well, done. Well, what do you think, this Maria? is interesting, so I am not going to stop uh, that conversation. Okay, because, excellent. Um, it's some historical events here. Um, Michael right. had the questions about... Uh, her uh, Gross's calculus from 1970s. So uh, you can develop Ooh. logarithms and exponents independently, and you can develop one through another or do them separately. I've been I doing them with young children with paper folding and uh, tree fractals, like a parent tree. Mm -hmm. And so you can ask, uh, like, uh, what um, generation from you are great-grandparents? And that's a logarithm question, really. And you don't need powers. You just need models. Uh, so you can do it with, without exponents um, to some degree. But uh, there are several different uh, efforts to that. It's really interesting, I think. And... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also happy to, to see Don here. And 
I want to say, I want, I just have one more question for, for you, Igor. So, okay. um, you said that things will get better. You sounded so optimistic there about what yeah. do and so on. Do you think things are better I, now? Do you like things better now than in the 70s, for example, in that regard? Well, I, I, I always joke about, about the that. now. Yeah, I always joke about it. I said, well, why was it better in the 70s? Well, I was 35 years younger. And I, that, that I would take over anything, you know, to be younger again. But uh, to be honest with you, things are much better. I, I wish I was younger so I can watch this whole thing evolve again and, and, and grow. I, I, I've been impressed with NCTM. I think they, and, and I'm particularly thankful for Dan Meyer because uh, he, he has shown how technology, he, he, he said, I don't know if I, doing anything on Math 2.0. Well, I told them, I said, you know, what you're doing is you're making the technology seamless. You're showing, you're really focusing on the math, and you're showing how the technology can, can illuminate the math. And that's always been my goal and other people's goals, I think, uh, uh, to do, to use, because in the early days it was, it was a conflict between uh, should, you know, technology or math. It was technology or math, and then, like in 1989, when uh, the first standards came out, technology was all mentioned as, a, as a, uh, just a resource. And it was like mentioned once somewhere in the text that I discovered. And in 2000, it became a principle, and then that principle really didn't evolve very well, and that, because people were still talking about it as something, an add-on to the math curriculum rather than being an integral part of the math curriculum. And I think that's at the heart of it. And I think that's what Dan has done so terrifically well. And so he's, he's a young man and he's got a long future, but I think what, what, what's going to happen is he's really the hub now of the young people in NCTM. In other words, and what's going to happen is there's a lot of people I was talking to Justin Lanier, who was one of the uh, people at the, uh, at the booth in, in, uh, in uh, uh, where were we in Boston? And uh, he's he's going to get his doctorate in the University of Georgia or somewhere. And I know that this is happening, and other people are taking the message that that you too can be a player of significance in, in helping teachers and students uh, evolve. And the kind of work that Don has done is just amazing because. Uh, I'm sure it happens in elementary schools where young people are shown the things, but it's rare. And I think we need a, a, a model that can get more people. And I think Maria, I'm, I want to acknowledge Maria since we're having this wonderful conversation. <laughs> thanking everybody. I want to particularly uh, acknowledge Maria because of the work she's been doing with young people. And I think Don and, and Maria have really have something in common here that they're changing the face of math education. And I think. Uh, and they're both destructive activities because they're not part of the curriculums. And that's what I mean by disruptive. It's a Clay Christensen uh, kind of model. And uh, uh, so, you know, slowly things will evolve. And, I, and, I, and I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. And uh, at my age, I'm optimistic. And I know Donna has, has, has done what he's done because he's been optimistic as well as my guest. So I, I applaud Don okay. and Maria. People talk about the good old days. <laughs> to me, these are the good old days. These are the good old days. As long as I can work with some kids. Yeah, lucky. Yeah, you lucky son of a gun. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. This is great to hear, and I think it takes quite a lot of people to make the variety happen. We need this diversity. We need this different things for different people, and uh, takes all of us and more. So it's just good to hear uh, of all the projects and of people meeting like that. Uh, good to it's it's nice when your mentors appear in your webinars. I just want to to say so for myself. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and for questions and resources. And Ihor, thank you very much for 
doing this for us. Uh, we have an applause button, which is not the raise your hand button. It's um, under the smiley face. There is a an applause. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Okay. <laughs> You're yeah, quietly we're taking it in. I appreciate you staying in. Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much, and thank you for making your book available. Uh, it's on Amazon, yes. so we can. And thank you, thank you for for inviting me to do this, so that I can begin to spread it, uh, news about it. So uh, the want to do curriculum, I want it to become a. <laughs> a part of the uh, vernacular people that are speaking about math education. So Excellent. I appreciate you inviting me. Yeah. Keep up thank the you. good work, all of you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, always. You too, Don. I expect to hear a lot more from you too as well. So thank you. Take care.